Well, today on Rethink Real Estate, we've got Michael Sakluna. Now, Michael is much to my surprise an Aussie, um, but uh, but either way is that he's a fractional CFO. And what that means is that he specializes in the financial elements of a lot of entrepreneurial businesses. Now, some would just call him a normal CPA or however you put that from an accountant perspective. But ultimately, I think that Michael has a deeper understanding of the financial systems, the tax laws, the structures. And with his partner, Brady, I think that ultimately they, these the tips that we go through today could be very, very helpful in the structure of the way that you might be operating your real estate business. Whether you're not doing books or you are doing books or you don't know how to read a balance sheet or profit and loss, but there's a great deal of tax saving that we talk about here as well and the way that you can set up a you know a consulting company in order to make sure that the luxury elements of your life are deductible as well. There's an awesome few strategies in here and I really enjoyed this episode. Hope you enjoy it as well. Welcome to Rethink Real Estate. My name is Ben Brady and this is a real estate podcast aimed to deliver sales strategies, marketing tips and business insights from industry experts and myself to build a listing-focused business for the future. Let's get into it. Michael, welcome to Rethink Real Estate. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me on, Ben. So the most hilarious thing just happened for those that are listening is that he jumps on the podcast link and goes, oh, you've got an accent. I'm like, oh, so do you. (laughs) So two Aussies that tend to meet up. I had no idea that you're an Aussie. So you're in Utah. How did you get to Utah from Perth? So I actually came here for school originally, um, studied mechanical engineering back home, started working out on the mines. As you probably know, everyone works on the mines in Australia. Yeah. Well, Um, certainly in Perth. Certainly in Perth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pretty quickly realized that wasn't for me. And so I decided I was going to change careers. And I figured if I'm going to change careers, may as well change country. Came here to Utah, uh, got a job, found a wife, and that was it. Now I'm stuck. So, so hang on, hang on, hang on. You don't just drop a map in, drop a drop a pin in Utah and go. Oh, I'm going to go there. Typically, you start elsewhere. Was it? Yeah. Was there a little bit of exploration? No. So, so I actually, um, it's religious reasons. I, I'm I'm a, a Mormon, so okay. I came here for cheap as school. Oh, you, uh, yeah. It's uh, it's real cheap if you if you go to school here and you're a Mormon. Oh, really? So, <laughs> so. So how does that, how does that, is that why there's a lot of Mormons in Utah? Well, other way around. That's why a lot of Mormons study in Utah because oh. Utah was kind of, well, actually the Western United States was uh, pretty well um, found by the Mormons. They all, they all came over and settled most of it, even California, but a lot of them just stuck around in Utah. So yeah, that's kind of how we all ended up here. Did you find, did you find religion um, when you came to the US or was it when you were in Perth? Did you grow up as a Mormon? Yeah, grew up as a Mormon. Um, my dad got baptized when he was like eighteen, and uh, yeah, so I, I grew up with it. I just you don't see a lot of Mormons in Australia. That's all. Nah, you don't. No. <laughs> I, I was uh, yeah, I was a drop in the bucket. <laughs> so how long have you been here for? I've been here for six years now. Okay, all right, cool. Because I was going to say I've been here for ten, and people say that I've still kept my accent completely. Is yeah. that it, it, you've kept yours pretty well as well? Yeah, you you got to work on it. You got to make sure you keep it because if I lose my accent, then there's not much going for me after yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I say the exact same thing. I play on it too much to actually lose it. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Michael, a loaded question to begin with, just so that the audience yeah. have a good understanding of it. Obviously, we've done a bit of an introduction already to the episode, but what do you do? So I that essentially I'm a fractional CFO and a CFO of an accounting firm. So. My business partner, Brady, he's the tax guy. He does tax consultations, tax filings. He's got a tax podcast, all that kind of stuff. Um, And then I do all of the, I manage a team of accountants and bookkeepers. And then I I do uh, essentially CFO advisory work. So within the company, Brady does all the stuff I don't like to do. And I do all the stuff that he doesn't like to do. Um, So when you think of accounting, everyone thinks numbers are numbers. But the tax guys and, and the accounting and CFO guys were very different. We, we actually, he, he's, he's all forms and I'm actually doing the journal entries and uh, Excel forecasting, all that kind of stuff. So we were talking about your portfolio of clients that you have at the moment. You've got a very wide scape because obviously we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the real estate portion of things today because that's the audience and the demographic that we're going after, and primarily yep. real estate agents. But what sort of categories or what sort of industries are you working across? Yeah, so... 
Primarily, uh, in a broad spectrum, I would say that we work with entrepreneurs, and mm. and so that means um, you, you've got your you know someone who's very new to the game. Maybe they're starting out in sales, or they're just starting up a little side hustle, and they want to make sure their books are all good. Um, all the way to people that you know they've they've got a company that's doing five to fifty million in revenue per year. Um, quite often those individuals will have more than one company. It's actually very rare that we work with someone that only has one company. Yeah. Uh, if you're a real entrepreneur, you, you don't have just one company. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. You may have one main company, but you've always got your toes dipped in a little bit of everything. So uh, because of that, uh, a lot of, especially people that start out in sales, they you know do really well, sell a bunch of whatever and make some money and they go, well, what should I do with this? quite often they throw it into real estate because as you know, and I'm sure as your listeners know, um, there's a ton of long-term benefits to real estate, especially if you've got cash available. Uh, but it is it is a way to develop cash as well. Um, it's, you know, you yeah. can take it either way. Well, I think that, you know, it's, it's funny that you say that because from the entrepreneurial spirit of what real estate ultimately is, I think that that's a great angle to go at for today because it, like – I, I always, <laughs> it's funny, you know, I'd like to think of myself as an entrepreneur as douchebaggery as that sounds. That sounds really <laughs> douchebaggy. Um, but, but, you know, I've always, I've been admired when people actually introduce themselves as that, no, no, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm like, really? Like, what does that, what does that actually mean? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it's funny though, because, you know, we've got our real estate business, but we have a total of, I think it's about 15 LLCs and probably yeah. in total about eight businesses you know, and then you've got also then your real estate investments that then you've opened up LLCs and then you've got trusts and all of that type of stuff. So what you're essentially saying is the complicated nature of those structures is something that you guys are very, very familiar with because, you know, like if I was to explain, and here you go, here's an Aussie, here's an Aussieation for you, is that we've got Australian investors and ultimately an Australian investor can't be, um, or an Australian can't be actually, if they're not a permanent resident in a C or S corp, or sorry, an S corp, so they have to be in a C corp. So therefore to get around all of that type of stuff, we have to have different company structures. So is that the stuff yeah. that you can help people with in general? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we take everything from, if you're starting a company, from the tax side of things, we help you set the company up. Obviously, um, CPA stands for, uh, you know, we, we can't really help you with legal stuff. We, we don't want to put our name on anything legal, but we'll set you up on a tax standpoint. So um, we'll make sure that you are set up correctly to file taxes and save on taxes as best possible. Right. But then we'll also help carry you through that. What we, when we started this company and as we've grown it, what we want to differentiate ourselves from others is we don't work for the IRS, we work for you. Yep. And the IRS is doing everything they can to stick their hands as deep into your pockets as they possibly can. And and we want to make sure that uh, we keep as much in your pockets as we possibly can. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, to have somebody like yourself in your corner, um, I think would be a very important element to actually having peace of mind. Could you give an example? Like, I know this is a very, I'm known for asking incredibly vague questions. So you can tell me to piss off very quickly if it's not a good <laughs> question. But I guess that is there like oh, there'd be very few times that you would sit in front of somebody that may have had already an established business because I'm assuming that it's very rare that somebody would probably come to you and maybe you do deal in networks where someone comes to you and goes, hey, I'm starting a business, Michael. Can you and Brady help me, um, you know, set everything up and do that stuff? Like obviously that's one section, but I'm assuming most yeah. of the time you're like most other accountants or most other financial advisors. When shit goes down, you're the first person I call to go, hey, I need help here, okay, because yeah. I've been managing this in my own right. Now it's a complete and utter shit show for lack of better terminology. Can you yeah. help me get out of this? What are some of the most common things that you see in very early stage businesses of what people neglect? Um, because our real estate agents, they run early stage businesses or small businesses, some payrolls, you know, all of that type of stuff. What are you seeing is the biggest n neglect from a tax perspective or just from a setup perspective? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you two things. Um, the first especially in real estate is piercing the corporate veil. And that's a pretty dangerous one in real estate because you've got some pretty significant assets, right? Right. So piercing the corporate veil essentially means you're, you're commingling your personal and your business expenses. That way, if something goes wrong, let's say a tenant tries to sue you and you've got your property in an LLC, so you think you're all protected. Well, the, what the court will say is they're like, well, you've just been mixing everything. So we're just going to pretend it's all, we're just going to assume that it's all one. And oh. so they'll actually allow you to, uh, or the 
tenant to then go after all your personal stuff. So, 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 so sorry, can we get, get, let's get hyper exclusive, oh, like, like, cause again, yeah. there's alarm bells going off of my own personal finances right now, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> but, uh, but like, wait, so, so I've got a, I've got a property in Virginia. It's a yeah. seven unit building. We created an LLC for it. It's, it's over there. Um, we just keep all the money separate and all the bills separate and everything along those lines, but it's not yeah. within a trust or anything like that. It's just, honestly, it's owned by us. Um, so you're saying that like, but, um, are you saying that if they can still come after us, obviously? Yeah, they can, but I'll, I'll actually add a little bit more to that. Let's say that you purchase a property with on a, um, you know, 5% down or something like that. Yep. Uh, if, if you purchase a property 5% down, you may only be putting somewhere between like 10, 20, $30,000 into the property. So not very much. Okay. The equity that you have in the property is all they can come after. Okay. So, so um, lawyers are kind of sneaky. What they'll do is that is they actually will look at whoever is a potential for being sued. They'll have a look to see what assets are under your name, and they'll basically determine whether or not it's worth it going after you. Right. Uh, unless the person suing is just going to pay them on the hourly. Most lawyers aren't getting paid on the hourly for you know civil suits. Um, but if they think that they can get a good chunk out of you, they'll do it pro bono, pro bono on commission. Yep. And in that case, if they think they can get a good amount out of you, they'll go for it. Right. So if you like when you first set up your first rental property, a lot of people freak out and they're like, I've got to get this in an LLC as soon as I can because I need to be protected. I would say that you probably don't because you've got crap or equity in it. Yep. And if anything goes down, like, what are they going to do? Take on your loan? Like they don't want to take on your loan. So no one's actually going to come after you at that point. Once you start to get in like, you know, over a hundred thousand in equity, that's when I'd say you you really do want to look at having more legal protection at that point. Um, that being said, everyone's tolerance is different. If you want to protect your $10,000 deposit, by all means, like protect that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a matter of making sure that you get an LLC at the right time eventually. You mentioned a trust. Obviously, trusts have more benefits than just an LLC. Um, uh, Not to get into the nitty-gritty details of this, but I I knew a guy that was getting sued, and he, uh, not for real estate stuff, but basically the lawyers were getting frustrated because they, on paper, he owned nothing. They couldn't find how he was living in his house, how he was running companies and all this kind of stuff. And it's because everything was owned by a trust and his wife was actually the sole owner of that trust. And so not like his name was not associated with anything. Um, So trust can actually, there's a lot of extra benefits that come from trust, but at the very least an LLC essentially separates the business and yourself as legal entities. Right, right. So piercing the corporate veil is one of the things that obviously is a, is a problem that you see. What are some other things that you think that early stage business owners are neglecting? So um, the second thing is not understanding your financial reports. Now, I know that first thing, most of the entrepreneurs that are sitting here are going to go, oh, it's, financial reports are easy. I, I know revenue, expenses, net income, no worries. That's your, that's your profit and loss. And um, if you don't understand a profit and loss, then then you need to get out of the business, <laughs> or, or you need to go educate yourself. Well, I, we've just lost though. probably ninety percent of our audience because <laughs> I, I've seen I've seen people stand in front of a profit and loss statement before and just be like, "Huh?" <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, that's the first point. So the, the profit and loss is is the most basic form of a financial statement, and and you've got to know what that is. That tells you how much money you actually made. However, when I when I first bring on a client or, or I guess when a client first comes to me and says, hey, can you have a look at my stuff and tell me what it's like? I don't even look at the profit and loss until I've looked over the balance sheet. The balance sheet is, is where most entrepreneurs fall behind because the, the balance sheet is a little bit more complex. You, you do need a reasonable level of, of accounting understanding to, to interpret it. But the balance sheet essentially is what feeds into the profit and loss. So if the balance sheet is incorrect, then the profit and loss is incorrect. The profit and loss could look great. It, it could look really pretty and you could look really profitable and everything. But if the balance sheet's incorrect, the profit and loss is incorrect. So if you're an entrepreneur and, you, and you're doing your own books, or even if your accountant is doing your books, it's actually really important that you 
learn how to read a balance sheet. Right. Just just read it, just to know what those numbers are. So, what are the things that you'll find on a balance sheet? So, so for the so for those that are listening, that are like, well, I, I thought it was only a P and L because there's yeah. another there's another question that I want to ask you after this, and that's going to be about cash flow because I think cash flow is one of the biggest the biggest. Thi- I, I honestly think yeah. that the cash flow is more important than the P and L essentially, um, yes. and that's my own that's my own opinion for the way that companies run because I don't think businesses go out of go out of business based on losing money. They go out of business based on cash flow. Compass. Is is a prime example of that for those that are listening okay but I, I guess that i guess that the balance sheet if you were to describe what's on the balance sheet for somebody in a very much layman terms versus the PL, could you go through that yeah yeah so in layman's terms the balance sheet essentially looks at um what you own what you what you owe or what liabilities you have and your and your um net worth so it Especially in real estate, everyone wants to know what their net worth is. That's actually where you should be finding it. Right. Um, I would I would venture to guess that most of the people listening to this podcast wouldn't know where to find their net worth, mm. and even if they did, it most likely is not correct. Yeah. <laughs> because, yep. and and this is this is not trashing on the people that listening to your podcast. This is trashing on accountants. Yeah. I the the longer I spend in accounting, the more I realize that there are a lot of lazy accountants out there. Sure. And unfortunately, what they do is they come along and say, "I'll do your accounting dirt cheap." Of course, they do it dirt cheap because they suck. Yeah. And so you end up with crappy books. Yeah. And so of course, then as a business owner, you go look at your books and you're like, "Well, this doesn't make any sense." So you just don't worry about the balance sheet. Yeah. Um, so I, if you like, I can actually give your listeners a, a few things to look for on yeah. your balance sheet. Let's do it. So um, if you have an accountant doing your doing your books, just ask them to send you the balance sheet for last month. Um, it, you know, we're what, halfway through, yeah, almost halfway through the month now. So they may not be finished with last month, um, but at least the month before. Um, fir- first thing to look for, if they can't give you your balance sheet for 2022 already, then you should get a new accountant. <laughs> Way <laughs> past time for that, but every now and then I see an accountant that can't get it done on time. So this is somebody that obviously they're going to be running your books for you because this yeah. is part of the part of the process. And maybe we take a step back here because I've got to be I've got to be very honest. Is that you know we have you know in excess of a thousand agents that work within our organization, and this is probably something, Michael, that I'm I'm probably not proud of as a leader is the fact that I don't think any of them run any real books on their business. You know, they're, 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 they're ultimately they're 1099 employee, they're 1099, um, you know, independent contractors that commission comes in, you know, they spend it all and then they get their tax bill at the end of the year and they think that that's probably how it works. You know, yep. at the end of the day, what might be some of the, like like partnering with somebody like you to do the books, is that is that something that is real, probably something that they should look at from the first degree? Um, yeah, but I'll, I'll give a qualifier to that. Okay. You can be a 1099 and never need an accountant. Okay. That being said, I would recommend if you're the kind of person that's ambitious and you want to grow and build businesses and, and have that over time, it's better to build a relationship with a good accountant early on and grow with them. Because one of the most frustrating things that an accountant has to deal with is when someone comes to them They've been running seven different businesses for five years and they say, oh, I've never used QuickBooks. I, I've never tracked anything. Here's my bank accounts. And the the struggle is what I'm going to do is I'm going to look back two years ago and say, hey, there's a $100,000 transfer here. What was that for? And you'll say, I mean, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Of course you won't. It was two years ago. And, yeah. and you'd think that you remember those things, but um, it, it just becomes more and more difficult. And it does get to a point where it's you just pass the point of return. Yep. You're never going to be able to get those together. Um, I'm actually at one of my my friends that he's working at quite a large company. They they do um, multiple hundreds of millions in revenue each year. They're looking to sell in the next two to three years, and so he's he's an, working on building their books to sell. They only just in 2021 got a got a good in-house accountant. And because of that, they don't have any good financial records from 2021 and before that, which anyone looking to buy is basically saying like, I don't want to touch this because- No question. Yep. 
It's not worth it's not worth it's not worth a dime really if you can't produce the actual books on it. Like like again, you could probably have a hundred million dollar company. It's worth a hundred million dollars, but then if your books are a disaster, it's probably someone wouldn't even pay you fifty. Yeah, yep, that's that's right. The the other thing that you got to consider too, because you know some of your listeners are sitting here saying, "Well, I'm never going to sell a business," so that's not me. Yep. But I I bet every one of your listeners has this little nagging fear at the back of their mind of the IRS coming and banging on their door and doing an audit. Absolutely. Um, and so I'll explain to you how the IRS does audits. Most people don't realize they've actually had an audit because audit sounds like someone comes to your door, they say, pull out every receipt you've ever had. That's that's one type of an audit, but that's the most extreme case of an audit. So I want all your listeners to think about the last time you got a letter from the IRS saying you owe us more money, basically. Mm-hmm. Yep. What they've done is an audit on a certain part of your tax return. So they've okay. said, okay, there's this one part of the tax return that we don't think you provided enough evidence of this deduction. So instead of just saying, can you provide us more evidence? They say, you owe us money. It's kind of sneaky because most people will just say, oh, crap, and they'll pay it. Um, we always tell our clients, don't pay it. Give it to us. We'll send in the evidence. And 99% of the time, they remove the fee. Huh. So, so just be aware of that. If you ever get one of those letters from the IRS, if you have an accountant, just send the letter straight to the accountant and, and nine times out of 10, you'll be able to get that back. Um, so what the IRS does is they do audits in levels. They look at one small part of your tax return and they say, okay, do they have enough evidence for this? And they go, oh, I don't know, maybe not. Let's see. If you just go and pay them the amount, then they might leave you alone. If you don't pay the amount or if you don't provide the evidence, then they may say, well, hold on, let's dig it, let's dig a little deeper. So they yeah. go one step deeper. And then if you don't provide enough evidence, then they go another step deeper. If you don't provide they just they just keep going deeper if you can't provide the evidence of what you're saying actually happened. Right. So where you get into trouble is if you don't have good records. So if if you send them just a, a bank statement and a bunch of receipts, they may go, nah, that's not good enough. We're right. not going to accept that as as proper records. And so they'll actually turn around and, and slap you with a, a, a fee for late filing and, and then, you know, re- reject the previous tax return, have you file a tax return now that you're owing a lot more in taxes. What, so what, having, type, of de- what type of detail would they ask for typically? So we, we see audits all the time and generally it's, it's just a, a matter of send us what this looks like um, in the transaction reports. It's, it's right. really simple for an accountant to put together. It's uh, it's not so simple for someone that doesn't understand what they're asking for, <laughs> right, right? Um, but also, it's not so simple when you haven't uh, done it. When it, yes. when it's just, like if we have to go back in time and make it up, it, it it actually makes it a lot more difficult to get through that. So again, this is a this is, might be a difficult question to a- answer because at the end of the day, there's many many different case studies or use studies. Yeah. So I believe that every I believe that every real estate agent that we know is a entrepreneur. They always have yeah. their fingers in a few different pies. They want to do different things, but I think that their limitations on the financial basis and the reporting basis and stuff can be a holdback a lot of the times for a lot of people wanting to do things. So having somebody in their their corner like yourself could ultimately help them out in order to grow or let them sort of be that visionary type of person that they ultimately are. Maybe not that detailed orientated person in the financial sense. Now. Yeah. Now, leading into this, though, like, what does it cost to have somebody in their corner from day one, though, Michael? I know that this is a difficult, probably, a- thing to answer because you don't know the individual circumstances. But what would it cost them to have, like, if they're a 1099 employee, or, or sorry, 1099 independent contractor at the moment, they want to obviously grow, open a business, and do some different things for investing in real estate and whatever? What would it really cost them a year to sort of have you in the in your in their corner? Yep, no, it's a great question. Um, so in answer, in answer to your question, I'm going to give you what the qualifiers are to really get started on that. Okay. If you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, it's not worth having a full time accountant. Right. It you just your transaction count's not going to be high enough. Really, you should just be doing your own books at that point. If I have to go and clean up your books for thirty to forty thousand dollars in revenue, that's not too difficult. Yep. Once you hit, say, a, somewhere between one hundred and fifty and two hundred and fifty in revenue per year whatever that looks like, that's where you definitely want an accountant. Um, there is a slight difference with real estate because you may be only doing 60, 70,000 in revenue, but you may have four properties right. that, that you're managing. And, and so that can get a little bit more complex. 
Um, so definitely talk it through. We, we do have an entry level uh, pricing. And so if you're just looking for accounting work, then we charge 250 bucks a month. And that covers all of your accounting. We, you know, we do your QuickBooks, we uh, run an S corporation payroll for you, all that kind of stuff. If you include that with tax advisory and tax filings and basically the full package, then it's 500 bucks a month. Yep. So it's a basically blanket. We, we do your books, we do your taxes, we talk to the IRS when they breathe down your neck, all that kind of stuff. Um, now I will say, I know we're not the cheapest on the block. Oh yeah, so, that, yeah, that, but you don't want the cheapest. You yeah, absolutely and, and do not. That's the thing. You can try out the cheapest if you want. I'm never going to be upset. Um, but you, you do run the risk of finding someone that is is really cheap that you know just causes you issues. But let's be honest though, if somebody's doing I mean, like let's say between one hundred and two hundred thousand dollars a year, I know that probably the audience that we have on here are relatively good performers, so they're probably a little bit more than that. You're going to save them three, four, five times that in the way that your efficiencies, oh, yeah. yeah, your efficiencies are in understanding where to look within those marketplaces or sorry, within those individual areas of what your expertise in. So yep. if we go I, I like so going back to the basic fundamentals of things, of understanding what they should be doing running books. Is there a, a learning place that they can go to, Michael? Like like, like at the end of the day, to understand a PL, to understand a balance sheet, all those things, is that something that you guys can walk them through or is that something that they should go to YouTube on or a podcast or something like that? Yeah, I, so we do actually teach our all of our customers because um, – I've realized that most entrepreneurs don't understand this. And so I want them to. I, yep. The thing is, I'm actually not as useful to my customers if they don't understand the reports I'm giving them. Got it. So, so I, I make sure that my customers actually understand what their reports mean. And the reports that we send, we don't just send a P&L and balance sheet. We actually send a breakdown report that will actually give them explanations of some of the different numbers. Mm -hmm. So they can go and read that on the reports if they you know need a refresher. Um, outside of that, I... No one enjoys accounting other than accountants. <laughs> so everyone avoids it. But it's it's a really good idea to just get a just a basic understanding of what's going on. So I would recommend, you know, go to YouTube, maybe take a crash course on YouTube. You could you could watch something that'll explain it in 10 minutes or something like that. Um, if you want to get a little bit more in depth and you want to take a course, I would recommend Udemy. Um, they don't pay me to say this, but you can get courses for 10 bucks. What's the number, name of the company again? It's called Udemy. It's just okay. an online, uh, they just they just provide courses and right. most of their courses are actually about 200 bucks, but every other week they go on sale for 90% off and you get oh, it for right. 10 bucks. And right, right. I've done a ton of those courses myself and you can get some really good, if you just need like, okay, I just need to learn this thing that I haven't done before and you want two hours of, of a course, really, really good. Uh, how, do I, how do you spell that? How do you spell it? U D E M Y. Okay. Udemy. Okay, cool. Well, that's yeah. it. Well, that's a that's handy for people to sort of understand and sort of sort of get, you know, is yeah. that is the basic fundamentals before you go into something a little bit deeper, like with an accountant, you probably should have a basic knowledge of it prior to. Like expecting that person to train you and go through all of those different things is sure, that's fine. But at the end of the day, there should be a basic fundamental of understanding. But let's yeah. let, let's go into let's go into some of the um what do you think are some of the deductions within real estate that people do not take advantage of? Like if I'm a realist, realtor and I'm out there and I, my expertise is in investing with clients or, or, or that's what I want to do, um, like in the multifamily space or in the fix and flip space or in the rent and hold space, um, what are some of the things that I should be aware of from a deduction perspective, from from what, it, what, are, what are some of those things that you see that are neglected um, advantages of real estate that a lot of the real real estate agents don't probably know. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I'm going to put a plug in for a book. It's not my book. Yep, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure a lot of your listeners have heard of Robert Kiyosaki. Yep. Um, he's kind of a good got rich a dad, poor dad. For yep. himself. <laughs> yeah, rich yeah, dad, yeah. poor dad. His tax accountant wrote a book called Tax Free Wealth. So I'm going to recommend that book because that goes into a lot more detail than what I'm going to go in. Okay. And and this it's a good book for an entrepreneur to read. And then and then as you have questions throughout the book, take it to your accountant and say, hey, are we doing this? Can we do this? But I, I will give you a few examples here. So 
Um, I'm sure that most of your your listeners are getting a depreciation on their property, which is great. That's the that's the biggest one. That's okay. the one that you want. But outside of the just the property and the deductions that you can take on that are the deductions you can take for having a personal management company. So you got to make sure you set up a personal management company and essentially you then act as a consultant for all your other companies. So you said you had like a bunch of companies. Yeah, 15 companies. So you should have one or maybe a couple companies that have ownership in these other companies. Right. And that's a consulting firm essentially. So that consulting firm, that is where you would purchase your car that you use personally. And, and that car would be owned by that consulting firm, the personal management company. That way you can take depreciation on the car. You can put all your services and everything that you, like anything you spend on the car can go into that company. Um, I'm sure that a lot of your listeners may have a spouse or, or some, you know, someone that they're filing taxes with. If you then have two people that own, have ownership in this personal management company, anytime you do something to, together, it's very likely that you can, uh, as long as you're talking about business, which mm-hmm. entrepreneurs always are, yep, yep, you can use that as a write-off. Every time I go out to dinner with my wife, I'm always talking money. She gets bored of it, but I'm always talking money. And so that's a business meeting every time we go out to dinner. Um, the, the fact that we're going out to dinner, it, it, you know, it's because we're busy. We've yeah. got busy lives. And so we're going out to dinner. It's a business expense. Um, one of my favorite ones is, um, and, and I'll preface this saying to say, uh, you, you got to look at these large multi-million billion dollar companies and what do they do? What are they getting deductions for? One of my favorite things that uh, people don't realize they can do is a corporate retreat. So multi-million dollar companies, they do corporate retreats all the time. It's very yep. common. It's a, it's a 100% deduction. If you and your spouse or business partner uh, go on a holiday or a, a vacation, we call it a holiday in Australia. Yeah, hol- yeah. Holiday, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, if you go on a vacation, you can actually use that as a deduction by calling it a corporate retreat. Now, you don't just call it a corporate retreat. There's certain things you need to do to make sure that it's actually a true deduction. So what we'll do, me and my wife, we'll, we'll plan a trip and I'll actually put together an itinerary for that trip and I'll say, okay, so we're going to go to Cancun, we're going to arrive at the all-inclusive resort, um, and when we first get there, we're going to go spend time at the beach just to relax. And then after that, we're going to have lunch and we're going to talk about the next year in the company. And right. then after lunch, we're going to go get a massage just to help us relax and spend some bonding time. And so each each point of the itinerary is saying, this is what we're doing. And then I have a description next to it saying, this is how it's going to help us or this is why this is beneficial to the business. This is why it should be an actual business deduction. Wow. Just by having that itinerary, and, and by obviously having the owners of the company going on this trip, that becomes a deduction. Now, I know that everyone here likes to go on vacation. Absolutely. So if you can put that vacation on the business, why not? Absolutely. There's no question. No question. Some of these things, you know, some of these things sound simple in theory, but yep. people would have never actually even thought of them. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. So I guess so I guess that so you've got the consulting company side of things. Let's say that I'm a 1099 employee uh, um uh, independent contractor. I can't I keep saying employee, okay? But what sort of like at the end of the day does it really matter if I open up a corporation or an LLC? Is there a recommendation on a corporation or an LLC? I know there's different type of corporations or LLCs. So would I rec- – anyway, long story short is that probably depending on the state that you operate in because you need to have a corporation if you're a part – if you need to be a licensed real estate company in California but in some other states you're not, there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes with that. But if they're just 1099, should they open up a company – and then should there be another company that is then the management company if it's we're really simplifying, like if it's just someone starting, so to speak? Yeah. So if you are if you're a 1099 and you're doing sales, so you're just selling real estate, that's all you're doing right now, you should open up an LLC. Yep. And the reason for that is FICA taxes. Okay. So if you're a you're 1099, everything you earn is going to get taxed at the highest possible rate, essentially. Right. Right. Whereas if you set up an LLC, you then start to be able to shuffle your taxes around by setting up an LLC and electing to file your taxes as an S corporation. Right. So right. so that's the ideal. Now, obviously, 
everyone's situation is going to be different. So I would recommend talking to an accountant of or, or a, um, a lawyer to make sure that it's set up correctly. Um, like you said, there are some certain corporations or businesses that need to be set up in a certain way. But by and large, if you're a 1099 making sales, it's going to be an LLC with the election to file as an S corporation. That's yeah. going to get you the best possible savings on taxes. It, it also gives you the legal protection that you're looking for. Um, and all those things that I just spoke about for the personal management company, if that's the only company you have, then that is your personal management company. Right. You don't actually need a, se a separate one on top of that. Okay. Once you then have multiple companies, then you would separate one and make it the personal management and then have a have ownership in the different companies. So one of the things that sort of caught me out from the sort of multitude of different companies that we have, whether it be the property management company, whether it be the auction company, whether it be the real estate company, all these different things, we started opening up a multitude of different companies for all the individual um, things that we'd own or a holding company, which would then have shares in all of those individual companies, is that one of the things that caught me off guard is that then how much it would cost for each individual one of those LLCs or corporations or whatever it would be in order to make sure that they're running or make sure that they're filed every year and whatever it is. It is an additional cost per one. So what is that additional cost to set up a company and basically to have it, you know, the tax returns done, you know, just a modest company making a few hundred thousand dollars a year? Yeah. So in that case, once you actually have multiple companies, you, you get the economies of scale, at, at least for our business. Sure. Reason being that... Um, the, the most difficult part of my job is communicating with the, the CEO because he's busy, he's got a lot going on and, and it you know, takes time to have meetings with him. But if I can meet with you and talk about five different companies, then that's one hour, one hour meeting with five different companies as opposed to five hours with different companies, got different it. people. Yep. So if you once you have multiple companies, we'll uh, essentially assess how your companies are doing, how large they are, how many transactions are going in, how complex they are, and, and give you a price for all of them together. Um, but it actually does get a lot cheaper. So it's not like you're going to be paying 500 bucks per company. Yep. In most cases, if you've got you know five companies um, and each of them are doing somewhere between half a million to a million in revenue, you're probably looking at paying somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 a month for, for everything together. Um, Depending on the complexity, you could be really simple and be cheaper than that. You could be really complex and be more expensive than that. That's a, yeah, it is a case by case because at the end of the day, if it is way over complicated, then ultimately there's obviously going to be more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what about the um, uh, just a final question on the deduction side of things is that, you know, your spouse getting paid a certain amount out of the company, your kids yep. getting paid a certain amount out of the company, all of those things need to be explored. Are those things that, you know, um, that is are those things that that book explains that you'd mentioned, Robert Kiyosaki's accountant or yep. whatever his name is? So Tax-Free Wealth, the accountant's name is Tom Wheelwright. So um, he should give me commission because I tell people about this book all the time. But uh, yeah, go go have a look at that book. He will talk about that. He'll he'll talk about. Um, I mean, he doesn't talk about every deduction ever, but sure. he will talk about paying your kids. He'll talk about making sure your spouse is in the books. I believe he he talks about the Augusta rule. Right. Um, the really nice thing about this book, while he is based in the U.S. and he talks about U.S. based taxes, he does talk about it generally enough that whether you you're living in Australia or Italy or wherever, tax law is. Relatively, the general the same. principles are the same everywhere. So yeah. you can take the principles that he's talking about, take them to your accountant in your home country, and say, "I want to do something like this. Tell me how you can do it." If your tax accountant says, "Oh no, you can't do that. That's a lot of crap," then go find a new accountant. Because yeah, exactly. Again, you want an accountant that works for you, not an accountant that works for the the tax guy. Right. Right. So, so. You mentioned a tax podcast that Brady does. Um, this is where the part of the episode where I want to get into some recommendations. Obviously, you've told us yeah. about a few books. What are some other books that you but that you like? If you if you have any others, some podcasts. Is there anyone on YouTube that you follow? Are there any mentors from a financial perspective? We've spoken about Robert Kiyosaki. Is there is there any is what what are you where are you going to from a perspective of who are the people that you surround yourself with, even though they might not know who you are? Yeah. Um, so another one is. Uh, hold on. I got, I got to make sure I get the name right. Um, it's why you should fire your CPA. <laughs> that's Give me one sec. doesn't sound doesn't sound like an ideal thing for you guys. But that's... Yeah. I know. Well, here's the thing. We we pick up a lot of. Uh, oh, here, here we go. 
what your CPA isn't telling you by Mark J. Kohler. Okay. So that that's a really good one. That one um, is it starts out with a a story, and it's um, I think it's a fictional story, but it starts out with a story that I think a lot of people go through, right. and and so it's a bit of an easier read. Um, but he goes into very similar things, like okay, like how should your CPA actually be be helping you? Um, I would recommend um, whoever whoever you are, whatever you're doing, uh, my my recommendation is go find as many books as you can right. in whatever you want to. I guess I guess really like the direction that you want to be heading. Um, but I think personal development is going to do more for you than anything else. Right. Because I used to not read any books. I, like, I, I think school kind of made me think I hated reading. Yeah. So for years and years, I didn't read any books. Um, and, and then I, you know, I got, I kind of got into it with one book and then got another one and really got into it. And what I found is that the more books I read, the better I got at enjoying and reading books. Um, let me just tell you one more. Again, I want to um, the compound effect by Darren Hardy. Compound effect by Darren Hardy. Why did that? The compound effect obviously is something that um, you know Warren Buffett talks about a whole lot as well. Yeah. Um, but so this is this is one that you like. Yeah, that that book changed my life. Oh wow! I like if if I had to pinpoint the success that I've had in my life to to one specific thing, it's that book. Why? It, it changed my mindset. So the compound effect basically says that there's no get rich quick scheme, there's no overnight success, none of that stuff. The compound effect is you if you do this the right thing consistently every day, then eventually you'll become an overnight success. Yeah, right. And and that um I think a lot of people get into real estate or they want to get into real estate and, and they think, geez, this is, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of debt. How am I going to do this? It just, it seems really hard. Um, and then you see the people that, you know, are just absolutely crushing it. And it's, and it's kind of hard to imagine you yourself being there yeah. when you're at the beginning. It's, it's making the little steps, the, the, the doing the little things every day consistently that's what's going to help you to to get there. No, that's great. What about um? What's the name of Brady's podcast from a tax perspective? His podcast call, is called Slacking Off. So <laughs> that's good. His, his name's Brady Slack. <laughs> is he is he an Aussie as well? Nah, he's not. He, oh, he doesn't have the accent. He's just uh, he's just smart. <laughs> he just sends you in for to charm them all, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, Michael, this has been incredibly insightful for our audience, I think, and and certainly from my perspective as well. Love to stay connected within the group and sort of yeah. continue the conversation. Is this is something that maybe we could get you on for for our group uh, from a seasonality perspective? But uh, but either way, I think that today's been been great. I'm going to have your social media and everything in the in the um, show notes. But what's a good website or is there a good email address that they should contact you on that we can have there as well yeah so if you send an email to info at highcountryfinance.com if you've got any questions if you want a consultation or anything we're more than happy to do a free consult and kind of like we're not out to to pick your pocket um we'll let you know what the best move forward is and if and if it's not the right time for you to have an accountant we're going to tell you that yeah because you know we want to make sure that you're successful yeah, you don't need the practice. There's no question. So, exactly. <laughs> again, thank you, Michael, for joining us. We appreciate it. Okay, thanks, mate. Have a good one. So about 75% of our audience hasn't liked, followed, or subscribed to our podcast. It would mean the world to us, and it would help this podcast more than you know to expand our reach if you were to like, follow, or subscribe on any of the platforms that you're watching or listening on. Thanks again.